Well, if you have your Bible, go ahead and open it to the book of Exodus. We have been working through the book of Exodus uh, for several weeks now. We're on chapter 8, looking at the 10 plagues of Egypt. Chapter 8, looking at the 10 plagues of Egypt. And today we're going to be looking at plague number 2, the plague of frogs. One of my personal favorites. (laughs) We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 15 this morning. And if you're there, would you please stand for the reading of God's word? Chapter 8, starting in verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will plague all your country with frogs. The Nile shall swarm with frogs that shall come up into your house and into your bedroom and on your bed and into the houses of your servants and your people and into your ovens and your kneading bowls. The frogs shall come up on you and on your people and on all your servants. And the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the rivers, over the canals and over the pools and make the frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. But the magicians did the same by their secret arts and made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, Plead with the Lord to take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go sacrifice to the Lord. Moses said to Pharaoh, Be pleased to command me when I am to plead for you and for your servants and for your people that the frogs be cut off from you and your houses and be left only in the Nile. Then he said, tomorrow. Moses said, be it as you say, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. The frogs shall go away from you and and your houses and your servants and your people. They shall be left only in the Nile. So Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried to the Lord about the frogs as he had agreed with Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. The frogs died out in the houses, the courtyards, and the fields. And they gathered them together in heaps, and the land stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, he hardened his heart and would not let them, would not listen to them as the Lord had said. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So seven full days have passed after God turned the Nile River into blood. Seven days where these Egyptians have to dig for water, where the fish are dying, the Nile stinks. Seven days where God gives Pharaoh an opportunity to repent for his sins and let the people go. But Pharaoh's heart remains hard, and he's adamantly opposed to God, as we've seen over and over again in Exodus. His heart is hardened against God. He remains adamantly opposed to God, and he assures himself that he's still the one in control of Egypt. And so again, God sends Moses and Aaron to Pharaoh with the message. God, again, makes that same demand of Pharaoh that he has from the very beginning. Thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. God is completely uncompromising in this demand. He will not allow for any concession. He wants their unconditional release, and he wants Pharaoh's unconditional surrender. And this time, that demand comes with a warning. If Pharaoh refuses to let the people go, then he is going to plague the country with frogs. And the Hebrew there for the word plague is literally to strike a blow. He's saying that I will strike Egypt with a blow of frogs. The scripture doesn't record what Pharaoh said in response, but we can be sure that he refused. And so God judged Pharaoh for his sin and his continued rebellion. And he tells Aaron to stretch out your hand in verse 5 with your staff over the rivers, over the canals, over the pools, and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. This is one of the funniest miracles God has ever done. It's literally an amphibious assault. It's amazing. (laughs) Frogs really aren't that dangerous, y'all. I don't know if you've ever been around frogs. There's some poisonous ones, obviously. But the ones that live in the Nile Delta, they're not uh, dangerous, uh, but they can be like a really huge annoyance. Has anyone ever been out in nature and tried to sleep anywhere close to frogs. They're super loud. They're super annoying. 
And, and if you've ever been around them at night, you know that they're there because they're very loud and they are absolutely everywhere in the land of Egypt. Scripture adds some really nice details here. It says some of the frogs end up in their ovens and in their kneading bowls. And when I'm reading this in my head, I'm thinking about the kind of oven that they had back then. You know, it wasn't kind of with a door. It was just kind of like an open clay thing where they would put wood in and then they would try to make their bread and stuff in the center, kind of like a, a pizza oven now. And as I'm reading this, I'm imagining this Egyptian woman who has just invented pizza. And she's making this pizza and she goes over there to check it out. And instead of smelling the sweet smell of pepperoni, she smells frog legs and she pulls it out and she's just disgusted at this and she puts it away. And because of that, it's thousands of years before humanity is blessed with pizza by the Italians. It's all because of this plague. And we can also imagine, right, that these women uh, are pulling out their kneading bowls and the screams that occur as they pull out these bowls and frogs just like jump on their face, right? I'm sure that was hilarious to see. And I'm sure the kids loved it, at least at first. The frogs even go into Pharaoh's royal chambers. And I'm sure that the psalmist actually got a kick out of this. He actually writes about the plagues of Egypt in Psalm 105, verse 30. And he says this, Their land swarmed with frogs, even in the chamber of their kings. We can imagine Pharaoh trying to go and lay down and take a nap, and he wakes up and there's this big old frog right on his chest, like hits him with its tongue on his nose. <laughs> right? Not even the king can get rid of these frogs. He can't hide from these frogs. And this plague is also super ironic, which we can always count on God to use irony. I love God for that. Because God uses the Egyptians' own beliefs against them. The reason that this is such an effective plague for the Egyptians is because they viewed frogs as sacred. In the same way as Hindus now will not kill cattle because they believe it's sacred, it's a sacred animal, the Egyptians believe the same thing about frogs. And so they're literally left with nothing to do than just let these frogs hop everywhere and be all over them. Because you would think that you could probably kill enough of these where you could have a, a modicum of normality to your life if you killed enough of them. But because the Egyptians refused to kill these frogs, they're everywhere. But as funny as this plague is, God's making a real serious theological point here. And that point is that he is demonstrating power over one of the gods of Egypt. And that god was the god Heket. Heket was the goddess that was either depicted as a human with a frog's head or was just a giant frog. Um, and it was believed that she was the spouse of the creator god of Egypt, Khnum. And in Egyptian mythology, it was believed that Khnum formed humanity on a potter's wheel and that Heket came and then breathed the breath of life into humanity, and that's how humanity came to be. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? God forming man out of the clay and then breathing into their nostrils. It's interesting how these, the, the demons that run these religions borrow from Christianity. But Heket breathed the breath of life into them. And she was seen as this agent of life-giving power and of fertility. And in Egypt, they, they really relied on Heket for two things. One was to control the frog population, which that didn't work. Obviously, that plague proved that she couldn't, which is one of the points that God is making. And it was also assistance with childbirth. It was believed that in childbirth, Heket was there to give the breath of life to children. And there's actually a connection between Heket and our own modern deities. As we've seen already, as we've looked at these plagues, the gods that were worshipped here in Egypt are very similar to the gods we worship today. They just have different names. And they're worshipped in slightly different ways. The Egyptians worshipped Heket because they desperately wanted some kind of control over childbirth. Now, we live in a time of, of modern technology. We live in a time where we have uh, seemingly really good medical care, where you know, we just had this beautiful girl, Amelia, a couple of months ago, and 
you know, from my perspective, I'm sure Christian, <laughs> Christian would disagree, uh, it seemed rather easy, <laughs> right? Uh, she got an epidural, so there wasn't, wasn't that much pain. The birth happened quickly. We were uh, talking with the doctor while she's in labor about what we were going to eat for lunch, right? It was just a very chill experience. <laughs> but what it's easy to forget is that in most times, among most people in the world, childbirth is a potentially life-threatening experience for both the mother and the baby. When Egyptian mothers went into labor, they were fearing for their lives. They were fearing for their own lives and the lives of their baby. And her only comfort in that moment was to cry out to the god Heket, pleading that this god would continue giving her the breath of life and that that baby would also receive the breath of life. Philip Ryken, one of the great commentators on Exodus, comments on the, the challenges and pain of childbirth and, and kind of how they would have experienced this. He says, childbirth is a spiritual matter, and the issues that surround it are among the most difficult spiritual issues women ever face. Many single women long to share their love with the child. Some married women are unable to have children. Others lose children through miscarriage. Then there are all the anxieties that come with actually conceiving, bearing, and delivering a child. Surely the most difficult thing of all is to give birth only to lose the child. These sufferings all find their ultimate cause and humanity's fall into sin. God said to Eve, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. And this curse refers not only to the physical act of childbirth, but to all the losses and frustrations that are associated with it. We live in a time now where all of those things are still very real. And in those times of discouragement, it's tempting to run to Heket to have some kind of control over this huge experience. Sadly, some make a sacrifice to the God of fertility by getting an abortion. If the baby is found to have some kind of abnormality or deformity, they're actually encouraged to kill it. I saw an article that was dated August 15th, 2017. CBS News published it and said the title was why Down syndrome in Iceland has almost disappeared. And you would think that that's amazing. How awesome that that genetic disease is not present among that population. And then you actually read the article and it says, quote, Iceland has almost eliminated Down syndrome by aborting virtually 100% of fetuses that test positive. Others sacrifice to Hecate by attempting to gain complete control over the kind of children that will be born through the creation of what's called designer babies. In May of 2022, there's a fertility clinic called New Hope Fertility Clinic. They posted an article on their website actually advocating for the genetic modification of babies through a combination of IVF and CRISPR technologies uh, and with the idea that you can make your baby immune from every disease and then you can also make your baby super intelligent, athletic, however you want it to be. Still others sacrifice to Hecate by making the quest for a child an idolatrous obsession. The children are seen by this person as that which will fill that hole in their heart. They think that they would just be complete if they just had a child and they will do anything to get it. If they only had a child in their life, everything would be fine. The sad reality is that Hecate doesn't offer any comfort to her worshipers. Studies have shown that most women experience emotional deadening and signs of trauma uh, beginning a decade after receiving an abortion. Which they sought to, that which they sought to make them happy has only caused more damage to their own hearts on top of the guilt they incur of killing the child. Designer babies only pro provide a false sense of security and control which only lasts until reality strikes and that child still gets sick, still fails to make the team, still hasn't, isn't as intelligent as others are. And after finally getting children, parents realize that that hole in their heart that the children were supposed to fill is just still there. Only the true and living God is able to bring comfort and healing to the deepest hurts in our hearts. 
I remember when we had not had children yet, we were, we were trying, we, we had been married for a couple of years, and we were really excited when we finally got that positive pregnancy test. And we were super excited. We just were telling all of our family immediately. We were so excited about what God had done, and he was giving us a child. And about six weeks went by, and we found out that that child had lost its heartbeat. And the child had died. And I remember getting, I was in college at the time, Kristen picked me up, and we sat in the car, and we just wept together. We could not understand why a good God would give us such a wonderful gift and then immediately take it away. And I remember in that car, we just prayed together in that moment, God, you have given us this gift and you have taken away. Blessed be your name. We still don't know why God did that. And I think sometimes we can never really fully understand why we suffer like we do. And it's easy to understand in those situations why someone would want to seek control over this thing that can hurt so deeply. Crying out to some sort of God who would give life and control back. But the only way that we began to experience true healing was to take all of that lost hope, all of that pain, all of that suffering and place it into the loving hands of the living God. Those who worship Heket, they can't experience that kind of healing. They can't experience that kind of comfort. Only God gives that kind of comfort, that kind of healing to those who trust in him. And that's why God was coming after Heket. He's proving through this plague that he is God. That God was false. It can't give life. It can't even control frogs. But I am the true and living God. I am the one who is sovereign over your children. And there's a lot of irony here as well in going after this God in particular. If you remember the story of Exodus, how it begins is Pharaoh is afraid of the Israelites. And so he tells his people to kill all of the first uh, uh, Israelite children, to throw them into the Nile, to commit genocide so that these people would not continue to grow. And now it's almost as if God is striking back at that very God they sought to satisfy by sacrificing those children to the Nile. But that's not where the story stops. Not only is God striking against Tekka, but we learn a lot about Pharaoh here as well. In verse 7, it says, The magicians did the same by their secret arts and made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. And what we've seen so far is we know that's either some kind of illusion or it's demonic power. Nevertheless, Pharaoh's probably not really impressed this time. He doesn't want more frogs. He wants them to go away. But the powers of Satan can only make it worse. And then in verse 8, Pharaoh does something astounding. As you can imagine, having frogs everywhere all the time would get really old really quick. I I don't know about you, but I I don't even want one frog in my house, much less hundreds or even thousands of frogs. Pharaoh must have gotten real tired of it because he does the seemingly unthinkable. He calls Moses and Aaron back to the palace in order to share a prayer request. And that shows us a couple of things about Pharaoh. One, it shows us that he's learned God's name. If you remember at the beginning of Exodus, Exodus 5, verse 2, Moses goes into Pharaoh and tells him to let the people go in the name of the Lord, Yahweh. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. So now he's learned God's name after this, and he's learned a little bit about God's power. He's learned that God had sent the frogs and that only God could take them away. See, Pharaoh's an example of a person who knows a lot about God but doesn't know God personally. Rather than praying God, for God, to God himself, he asked Moses and Aaron to pray for him. 
And he knew God was real. He knew God was powerful, but he refused to submit his life to them. You know, sadly today, you can find that same kind of person in usually two different groups. One are so-called atheists who say they don't believe in God, and the reason they don't believe in God is because they're mad at him. Right? They say, well, I'm, I'm really mad at God. Well, that just means you believe in him. You're just upset. But anyway, you can call yourself an atheist. And the second and probably more prevalent one here in Abilene is they know God is real and powerful. And they call themselves Christians, but they're actually believers in name only. People who say, you know, I grew up in a Christian household, I, I, I go to church every now and then, I call myself a Christian, but when you look at your life and their lives, there's no evidence that they're actually a believer. Unfortunately, I think there's many in our city who fall under that second category. And like Pharaoh, they only call out to God in times of trouble but don't trust him as Savior and Lord. You know, this is the kind of person who's like, yeah, I believe in God. I never really talked to him, but like when, they, like growing up in college, you know, if they had a test, all of a sudden they're praying the day of, saying, Lord, please deliver me or, you know, help me get that parking spot. Help me get that raise at work. You know, whenever there's some kind of trouble, that's when they're crying out to God. And then every other time, we're just going to leave God kind of in the background, kind of ignoring him. They want all the benefits of following God without actually being forced to repent of their sins. And what that does is it actually reduces God to some sort of divine vending machine to give you what you want and divine fire insurance to, you know, do just enough, pay just enough to get out of hell, but no more. But just like how God reacted against Pharaoh, God will not be mocked. He won't be treated that way. And God demonstrated that he was the one in control, not Pharaoh, by allowing Pharaoh to determine the time that the frogs would die. He says, uh, Moses said to Pharaoh, Be pleased to command me when I am to plead for you and for your servants and for your people that the frogs be cut off from you and your houses and be left only in the Nile. So he's demonstrating his faith in God, saying, you can dictate the time when these frogs are going to go away, and God will display his power by following that word exactly. And you would think, like, this is just me. If I was given that option, I'd be like, today. I want to see these frogs gone today. Get them out of here. But apparently, Pharaoh just really wanted one more day with his frog buddies before they croaked. And God and he said, tomorrow. And so, the next day, Moses and Aaron go out and they plead to God, and the frogs die. They all go and they're piled up. And Pharaoh makes this strange promise to Moses and Aaron. He says, if you'll do this, if you'll go pray for me, if you'll get rid of these frogs, I will let the people of Israel go. You can go worship your God. Go, be done with it. Of course, that turns out to be a lie. You know, sometimes when people make any kind of promise to stop the pain, uh, if you've had children, you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> children just have the inane, or, you know, insidious, I would say, ability to just wear you down. They will ask for the same thing over and over and over again for weeks until you finally break down. And you have to have a will of iron in order to stop them because they are an unstoppable force, especially my son, Elliot. He is tenacious. He will stay on that same subject for, it doesn't matter how long. One time he was on swimming lessons for like five months was on this until we finally got him swimming lessons. You know, sometimes parents will promise anything to their kids in exchange for 10 minutes of silence. If you will just stop talking for just a couple of minutes, you can have whatever you want. Go watch your show, here's some candy, go to your room, you can eat in it, fine. Just give me 10 minutes. And that's kind of what Pharaoh does. He just wants peace. He doesn't want to worship God. He doesn't want to acknowledge God. He doesn't want to give up control to God. Instead, he simply wants the pain to stop. 
Nevertheless, all the frogs die. And it says, the frogs died out in the houses, the courtyards, and the fields, and they gathered them together in heaps, and the land stank. And that is just such an understatement. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart and would not listen to them as the Lord had said. So the frogs die, now the whole place stinks. And again, God's always good for irony because earlier the Hebrews, when they went into Pharaoh, they were, came out saying, we are a stench to Pharaoh now because of what you've done, Moses. And now Egypt is a stench to God. But again, Pharaoh again is an example to us. The unfortunate thing about the plagues, while they're fun to read and, and interesting to think about, what we really don't like doing is finding ourselves in the scriptures. Oftentimes we want to identify most with the heroes of the Bible. Moses and Aaron, we'd say, oh yeah, you know, I would totally be that guy who would go in and would proclaim, you know, let the people go. One, Moses wasn't that great. He's just now starting to obey eight chapters in. Two, we're really more like Pharaoh than we care to believe. We are much more like Pharaoh than we want to admit. See, what Pharaoh is an example of is false repentance. He wants the pain to stop, but he really doesn't want to submit to God. And sometimes we do that too. Sometimes we're walking in a pattern of sin and we're being given the consequences of that sin, whether it's relational or emotional or physical. Maybe we're walking in sin, people are walking in sin, and they're having to suffer going to jail if it's that bad. And people cry out to God saying, God, I'm sorry, I will follow you, I will do what you say, if only you will make this thing stop. But what it really comes down to in our own hearts is that we just want to stop suffering the consequences of the sin. That's the motivation behind false repentance. False repentance doesn't want to honor God, doesn't want to turn our hearts and submit to God. It just wants to feel comfortable again. It wants to have all the fun of sinning without any of the consequences. We want our cake and to eat it too. And that's what false repentance is. See, repentance is more than just saying sorry and temporarily stopping a behavior in order to get everything back to kind of normal so you can stop feeling guilty for a minute. So you can, you know, not feel as ashamed that you did that thing. False repentance does not have a concern for God, only the discomfort that the sin brings. As followers of Jesus, though, we're called to live lives of true repentance. Jesus actually showed us that our lives are meant to be one of daily repentance in the way that he taught us to pray. That the, the Lord's Prayer, he says, Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now, you think if you're praying for your bread daily, you're also praying for the forgiveness of your sins daily. And Jesus was showing his disciples and showing us that as his followers, our lives are meant to be ones of daily repentance to God. That's what our lives are supposed to be. And what repentance really means for the Christian is to change your mind about your sin. See, false repentance still loves the sin and just wants to not feel bad about it. True repentance sees sin for what it is and it hates it and agrees with God about how terrible that sin is. So when we truly repent, you need to ask yourself when you, the next time you need to repent, Am I motivated by just trying to make this stop or do I, am I agreeing with God that this is evil? Am I changing my mind about that? But not only is it just a change of mind, it also entails a change in action. True repentance 
will bear out not only in how we think, but how we actually act moving forward. True repentance is concerned with coming into alignment with God's will and acting in obedience to God because he deserves it. Jesus was preaching in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, and he talks about what true repentance looks like. He talked about changing your mind, but then he also said, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Of course, these are metaphors. But the idea is that sin is so serious that we need to do whatever is necessary, take extreme measures in order to stop doing this evil thing. He says, better to go into heaven maimed or losing an eye than to go in hell with your whole body. We need to be serious about our sin, taking drastic measures. And that means for us, if if you need to figure out how you're going to repent, how to change your behavior, it means you need to stop the behavior and you also need to put safeguards in place to make sure you don't do it again. If you've got a problem looking at something on your phone, you need to delete the app, you got to get accountability partners, you need to you know, do all of these things to stop doing that thing. If you've got a problem with anger, you need to confess it to people and get people around you to help you when, they, when you see that you're being angry, who can step in and stop and, and calm you down. We have to take sin seriously. And repentance means that we must change our behavior as well as our minds. Now, you may be sitting here thinking, okay, yeah, that's great. But you don't know about me. I've been struggling with the same sin over and over and over again for my whole life. And I feel that I've truly repented every time. What do I do in that situation? Well, first, again, ask yourself, check your heart. In those situations, is your motivation stopping the pain or is it changing your mind about your sin? Are you truly repenting of that thing every time? If you're not, I would encourage you that you need to take more drastic measures. And if you have, and I believe that there is a way in which we can genuinely repent of sin that we do over and over again. Jesus doesn't expect us to be perfect. He knows that we're going to continue to sin for the rest of our lives until we're in heaven with him. At some point, we're going to repeat the same sin. So if you've been struggling with repeated sin in your life, and you have been truly repenting, take heart in that Jesus knows that we all sin. And that every sin that we have committed and ever will commit is covered in the blood of Jesus. See, when Jesus died in your place, he didn't just die for all the sins that you had done up until the moment you believed. He died for all of it. He paid the full penalty for your sin. He took all of your sin on himself. He paid the penalty. He bore all the guilt. He took all the shame. Scripture says that he became sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. See, that's the scandal of the cross in that God himself became as a sinful person, taking on all the sin of people who hated him and then gave those same sinful, rebellious people his perfect righteousness gave them his perfect record, gave them his perfect credit score. He has done all of it for us. And yet, the struggle with sin is real. We struggle daily, and the enemy loves to point out that we have fallen and we fail. And it's so easy to be discouraged when we fall into that same sin and we we think to ourselves, how could I still do that? I'm a Christian. I've been following Jesus for this many years. How could I still do that? And that's when Satan loves to step in and say, look at you. You don't, you're not a Christian. You don't deserve to follow him. And the truth is you don't. But that's the glory of the cross. It's not about you deserving it. It's about God 
loving you. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That is how he showed his love to us. The beauty of the cross, the beauty of God's continued grace and continued forgiveness and continued faithfulness every single time we sin. And the reason that we can even turn to him over and over again in repentance is because God's love for you is so deep and wide and strong that it covers over everything. The Psalms say that God's love for us is as high as the heavens and that he has separated our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. So great is God's love for us. Frederick Martin Lehman wrote a hymn called The Love of God is Greater Far. And it's a beautiful song. I encourage you, go look up the full lyrics after this. It's an amazing hymn. But it's most famous for the very last verse of the hymn. And I'll leave you with this. Could we with ink the ocean fill? And were the skies of parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. How great is the love of God for you. Hold fast to his love today. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word and I thank you for showing us this idol in Heketh and how you are stronger than this false God. And Father, also thank you for showing us what the difference is between true repentance and false repentance. Father, we freely admit now that we have failed to truly repent every time. Far too often, we are way more concerned with feeling better than actually turning our heart to you and walking in obedience and agreeing with you about our own sin. And Father, maybe there are those of us now who have done that. Holy Spirit, I ask that in these moments that you would stir up those times in our heart. And that in these next moments where we sit in silence, would you bring those times to mind that we might confess them to you? Father, help us now in this moment truly repent. Truly turn our eyes to you. Truly turn our hearts away from our sinful desires and to you. And Father, that can only happen by your Holy Spirit working in us. So Spirit, I ask that you would turn our hearts, that you would transform us, that you would bring about true repentance now in these moments as we confess our sins to you. Father, your word says that when we confess our sins to you, that you are faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, Father, now having confessed our sins and having truly repented, Father, would you help us now to rise in the joy of our salvation? Help us to no longer wallow in guilt and shame, but to feel the joy that comes from being your child to feel again your mercy and your love and your grace. Father, would you overwhelm us now with that? Remind us of just how much you love us. Father, we pray all these things in your holy and precious name. Amen.